This entire episode is making me sweat. Hey guys, it's Mickey. It's Kevin. And today we are back with another sassy episode. Today is going to be a long and potentially very difficult conversation. Kevin and I are both sweating before even getting into it. It is AAPI Heritage Month. It's also the first episode back since we have gone to Asia. So we figured this would be the best time to have the crucial conversation with you guys about Asian parents, how to deal with them, how to deal with their love, how to show them that you love them empty nesting growing up how to grow up how to grow up and basically an a to z guide for things that we wish somebody told us while we were going through all of those things and are still going through and still going through very much so so we've tried to compile all these things into some categories and then mickey also asked some folks to ask us some questions so those will be sprinkled in throughout the episode. Yes, so we will be talking about cultural expectations, growing up and the transition into adulthood, mental health, relationships with significant others, financial obligations. Finally, we will talk about some solutions to our problems and some concluding thoughts. Disclaimer, every Asian family, every Asian parent is a little different, so not everything will apply to every single family. I think the biggest thing is that Asian parents mean well. They want the best for them and for you. Yeah, and I'm not sure that that's an excuse for some of the things that go on, but I think it's remembering their intention. Let's start off with some cultural expectations and why it can be difficult growing up with Asian parents or growing up Asian American where your expectations may be very different than that of your peers. So number one, the idea of not being able to talk back. I think that can be a little difficult for some kids more than others. I think for me, I just ended up not saying a lot of things. I just kind of nodded and then it made me not share everything with my parents. It's hard because I think when you're a kid, your default is to respond back and try to defend yourself or explain your point of view. But oftentimes with Asian parents, when you talk back, it makes things worse. Like if you don't talk back, let's say the conversation is a five minute conversation. But if you talk back, that ends up being like an hour lecture going through not only the points that they talked about, but also the ones that you talked about. So I think in a lot of ways, we grow up just not standing up for ourselves or speaking up for ourselves. And then that translates to kind of how we act in the workplace too. A lot of the times I feel like Asian people tend to not fight for what they feel like they deserve, like whether it's a raise or on a project, on on something that they're really passionate about. I think we're just not very good advocates for ourselves often, which I think is a direct response from how we are with our parents because we just kind of follow the rules and let things be. How do you feel about the idea of my way is the highway and that's why we don't talk back to them? I mean, sometimes it's easier to say yes and follow along with whatever they're (laughs) doing, right? And oftentimes it's probably not the worst thing. Like what they're saying isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I think a lot of the times what they're saying is true and there's hints of truth to it, which I think hurts us even more because it's not that we don't recognize it, but sometimes it hurts to hear it said out loud, especially if it's said in a harsh manner. But there's also different times in which you should think about, you know, things that you should discuss versus things you should let go. There's like daily things. They're like, oh, you shouldn't go here. So like, for example, you know, when all the riots and things were happening, your parents like, please don't go outside at all versus like your life plans. Like you should only be a doctor or engineer. Like there's different things that you can advocate yourself for. You have to choose your own battles per se. Yeah. How would you advise somebody deal with that? If you're like really struggling, you're having a hard time and a lot of the times they're saying a lot of stuff to you and maybe you don't agree with it. I think the one of the biggest issues with at least with my parents and people is the communication. It's like hard to communicate with them. So I would start by trying to talk to them about things that are less important in your life and trying to have mutual conversations Mm -hmm. with them but i think it's difficult i think you have to pick the battles that you're willing to fight like some of the kind of smaller things or things that don't matter as much i will just swallow the same way that like your friends would swallow some things or you swallow for your parents or they swallow for you right Mm -hmm. you have to pick which things are worth standing up for because i feel like when you stand up for everything that it invalidates the standing up experience so here's a question that i think is relevant to this topic that one of your viewers sent. 
my English is better than my Mandarin, and my parents' Mandarin is better than their English, so it's very difficult to express each other. How do you deal with the language barrier, and how do you better communicate with each other in this way? Ooh, I feel like that's like an SAT question. That's really difficult. I think sometimes even if you speak the same language, even then it's already so difficult to communicate, let alone if there is a language barrier, which inevitably, like I literally speak fluent Mandarin and I feel like there are still some things I can't properly convey the way that I would be able to convey in English or like when I get riled up or upset, my default is to speak English, whereas their default is to speak Mandarin. My parents, obviously, they get upset and defensive when I start speaking English because they're like, that's not how we raised you. Like, that's not what we understand. But I think if you can't properly communicate and also I feel like I get hot headed. So what I try to do is I try to write down the things that I am trying to convey. And maybe if you're not that fluent in that language, you can get some help from Google Translate or get some help from friends who can help you convey that. And then also it'll be a more level headed version of it, right? Because you're not like screaming it at them. I think writing it down is a good option because you can like spend some time and if it takes you a little bit more time to hash out your ideas it's probably not the best to text your parents the conversations (laughs) but to like maybe have a piece of paper and have all the things that you want to say written down there and totally talk to them about it and also like it makes it seem like you're more sincere like you're, you're spending the effort and time okay moving on do your parents do this they never admit that they are wrong I think they've probably admitted they're wrong maybe once or twice in their lives or like they just stop talking and you It's very difficult to get Asian parents to apologize or like explicitly say that they're wrong. I think they subtly recognize it, but it's never an explicit. They're like, oh, sorry, this situation was probably different than what you were talking about. No, there's no sorry. There's no sorry attached to it. It's just like a, this is a different scenario. Exactly. Why, why do you think that mentality is there? Like, do you think that when you are older and have kids, you will have the same mentality. I would like to think that I will not have the same mentality. I think there is the element of like, oh, I'm older, I'm wiser, I know better. Do you want to talk about what your mom told you about? You know, we're both healthcare workers. Yes. And we were traveling in Asia recently. Yes. And I got wildly sick. And of course, I call my mom. You know, my voice is raspy. And she's like, are you sick? And of course, I say, yes, I'm sick. And she says, you know, make sure you drink ginger tea. Make sure you're wearing a lot of extra clothes don't forget a jacket don't and eat I, your matcha ice cream yeah don't eat ice cream and i responded and i was like mom you know i'm a healthcare professional right like i, I know how to take care of myself and she said i've been a human and i've been getting sick longer than you've been alive on this earth for over 50 years no you mean 30 years 30 years 30, 30 years. years but again like older wiser like same concept right it's it's that mindset i think how about the family first expectation So I think in Western families, it's quite common, you know, you'll see people who put their friends first and then a lot of the times their familial relationships are like a I text you once a month kind of thing, which doesn't really fly in the Asian family. The way that Asian people see it, it's you and then it's always your family. And then maybe it's like your significant other or your relationship. It's also amplified by the, you know, Asian American experience where, I mean, at least for both of our families, our parents moved here by themselves Mm -hmm. with only us so our like you know extended family are farther away so the small central family circle is like really small and tight so the biggest issue here is that anytime you have time off or you have things to do then it's a direct competition with family time let's say you have two weeks off a year if the majority of that is not spent with family then it can be seen as not prioritizing your family or that that you don't have your priorities straight right it's it's more difficult too if your family isn't in the city that you live in right? right because then Like you genuinely don't see them regularly. What is a solution or what can we do about that? I think the best thing you can do is that you will probably have different ideas compared to your parents. You you know, if it were up to them, they would spend 24 seven with you. You would spend every vacation with them, but you have to figure out what's reasonable for you. One thing that Asian parents, I think always appreciate is if you tell them beforehand what your plans are, you need to communicate. I think that's what I struggle with because Again, back to the very first point that we were talking about is communication, right? Well, because you don't want to upset them. So you hold off on telling them about your plans. But if you don't tell them, they also get upset. But I would say the earlier you can tell them, 
the better it is and the more understanding they yeah. will be. Like, they'll be a little upset maybe, but it usually Not as gets much, better. Yeah. So things to work on. Communication, I think, is the key to a lot of the topics in this section. How do you deal with your parents comparing you to other kids? There's certainly a lot of, comp- not competition, but, you know, yeah. your parents talk to their friends about you all the time, right? Yeah, like, and they're, they're like bragging. Yeah. Not like bragging, but like showing you off. Yeah, they're like, oh, here's my son doing this, doing yeah. that. They did this, and then someone yeah. else has to one-up them. Like, for the most part, I would say that our lives are better than their lives because yeah. of what they gave to us. So they're living, I'm going to use this big word, vicariously through us. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but... Do you think you were compared mostly academically or in what regard? In every single way. A lot of it's like gossip too, like things that humans really like. They're like, oh, you know, this person's daughter got into like MIT but didn't get into Y and Z. Or Okay, so I would say that I was never compared academically in that sense like yes like you know my parents would be like hey so and so got into what school but the biggest comparison i felt was oh they did xyz for their parents you know or they don't talk back to their parents like tama how guai like they're so good okay other expectations this idea of growing up quicker especially for a lot of immigrant kids a lot of our parents may not speak the most fluent english which means that we are growing up having to translate documents we're having to make phone calls to government officials Uh, you're often the one who's in line having to order fast food but it kind of makes you grow up a little bit quicker than everybody else maybe for you i think my parents are pretty independent I feel like a lot of it was not even that they couldn't do it, but that they pushed me and encouraged Mm -hmm. me to be independent and do these things. But I I do think it makes you a little bit more mature early on, which especially when you're young, even like a couple months of an age difference is so significant that you'll notice a very big gap from your peers. I guess the last thing is the big question that I think everyone has about the culture expectations is what happens if your parents really only have a couple job options for you culturally like you have to go to college you have to do x or y i think that what asian parents want for you is stability they want you to go to college because getting a degree means that you will be able to get a good job and getting a good job means that you will have money which means you will not starve and you will have a roof over your head so they have a very safe mindset in general i agree with everything that they think i think it's the most traditional way to kind of plan your life unless you have some sort of very drastic passionate vision that differs from that and you are willing to put in the work and deal with the consequences of your own actions, then I think, yes, you are free to explore. You are free to make the decisions that you want to make. Like, let's say you're really passionate about being an artist and you're talented and you're good at it. I don't think you should ever stop pursuing your passions or your dream. But is it possible to maybe do that while also fulfilling some of the expectations, still getting a degree, you know, maybe something related to art? I think the most important thing is that you need to be ready for your parents to not financially support you if you're going to make a decision that goes against their ideas, which sounds horrible but i think it's only fair you can't expect them to pay for your stuff if you're not going to follow through with their expectations right yeah what's like making an investment without proper returns right you can't that's true you can't just throw away money yeah they or at least in their head in their what mind, they, they think can't, is they can't finance something that they feel like has no return if you had asked me that before i went to college i think it would have been like parental love should be unconditional like why is it contingent on what i choose but i really understand like yeah. both sides but in general i think asian parents compared to other parents are probably the mo- more invested in your future than yeah. anybody else so and oftentimes yeah. they come around like it might take them a while but a lot of the times they'll come around like once they see that maybe there's some sort of fruitful thing so right. one of the biggest hottest debates in our comment section is do you owe your parents for raising you Food. financially or like in any sense of the word owe financially and emotionally Think- because technically they chose to give birth to you right that that's the american argument i feel like there's less of a financial obligation to pay back every cent that they've spent on me mm-hmm. but i think there's a more emotional like they're your parents right they raised you up there's 
that expectation that exists you and somehow should, return it yeah and in, in some way or the other it doesn't have to be like one-to-one but in in, in some capacity like if mm-hmm. they are having trouble or anything like you are there no question so there are also a lot of parents who expect a one-to-one return or even more and do you think that's reasonable well, it depends on what kind of financial situation the kid is in. Let's say they're it's, like doing okay. They're working like a good stable job, but it's they're not making life-changing money. I think it's so complicated because I think as bad as it sounds, when it's expected, I want to do it less. When it's something like I want to give it to you and I want to do it for you, it makes it all the more special. But it's such a difficult situation talking about family and money, right? Like there's no yeah. contracts written, like what is one-to-one, like what are th- what's the interest rate? But there are yeah. a lot of Asian kids out there who their parents expect them to financially support the family once they get a good job. And I think that's an immense amount of pressure. If it's, you're compromising your own life to a degree where you're not even happy and you're not fulfilled, like I think that... That needs to definitely be evaluated. Yeah, like if you are unhappy with your job and you want to go back to school and change your career, like you can't do that because your job is you're supporting more than yourself with your salary. Next up, we're talking about growing up Asian American and the transition into adulthood and the empty nesting that comes along with it. So can you define empty nesting for us a little bit? That's what happens when, you know, you leave as a kid and you leave your house and your parents are by themselves and they have a lot more free time because they're not sending you to violin school swimming camp after school activities so they ended up gaining hours and hours of free time this entire episode is making me sweat i think a lot of white kids go through their rebellious phase earlier so middle school slash high school that's when you kind of like do rebellious things you like sneak out at night whatever it might be I don't even know what those kids do because I wouldn't have been allowed to do any of that but I think a lot of Asian kids go through this rebellious phase a bit later it's typically college college because college is the first time you taste freedom it's the first time you are living away from your parents right you have adult responsibilities like cooking laundry things that maybe your parents did for you that you finally have to do yourself so for the first time like maybe you're allowed to sleep over at a friend's or have people stay over go out late at night do a kickback if you lived at home you would not be able to lie about these things right it'd be impossible but if you're at college the opportunities are endless right i think one of the biggest things at least in america that brings freedom is when you're able to drive yourself So for me, I started driving probably in the middle of my junior year, which is, I think, on the relatively later side. I think that marks a pretty drastic transition. Before, you had to, like, wait for your parents. You have, like, a home base, like a car you can put, like, your clothes. It's like a little mini home outside Mm -hmm. of your home, a retreat. A lot of my other friends, they started driving literally, like, they were waiting for the day that Tarrant turned 16 to get your driver's license. But for me, they're like, oh, is it like my parents are worried? Is it safe? Like, make sure your car is like we get a car that's fine. And mm-hmm. then also like they're like, oh, you should only drive from your school to this. To, like there's only like three or four places that you're allowed, you're to, allowed go. to go to, which is I think is reasonable because I think when I was growing up, we didn't have like a tracking GPS or anything. So it would be bad if they didn't know where I was. But I think so for a lot of kids, you go to college and then you kind of see how other people maybe have it with their parents. Then you start to inevitably compare, right? Like, hey, my parents don't let me do X, Y, and Z. How often did you call your parents in college? Every day. Same. But not a lot of people did that. Was it voluntary? I mean, I think it was just part of the expectations. It wasn't really voluntary or, or involuntary. It was just part of your daily routine. I think it can feel... Like sometimes you're really busy with and random stuff. It doesn't stuff. take much time, but it's like hard. To, like texting is so much easier, but it just doesn't have the same. Right, but texting doesn't work for Asian parents. Yeah, they just you gotta, especially they gotta if hear. there's like a language barrier. Well, let's get to this main topic here, where you know you're in college. It's it's kind of another double standard where your parents always think of you as a kid, even though they want you to grow up 
and kind of navigating that. They're like, they choose you, like when it's convenient, they decide that, oh, you're an adult be, now. Adult. For example, when it comes to academics and handling all that, they're like, you're an adult. You should be able to do this all on your own. Like we shouldn't have to handhold you. But then when it comes to like relationships, like you don't know how to handle right. what is it? Like, you need more experience. You're not an adult. Like you're still a baby. So. And I think on the flip side for us, we think we're independent and we think we're strong enough to be independent. But the truth is that most of us are still financially dependent on our parents during this college time, even if they're not paying your tuition, even if you're on scholarships or grants or financial aid, if they're paying for your living expense, if they're paying for or helping with anything, technically you are still, it makes sense that they have quote unquote control over you. As you're fighting for your independence, you're like, I don't want to be controlled. I've got a taste of this freedom. I know how other kids are living and they ain't living like this. So I think college is the time where a lot of kids can fight with their parents. Is college the first time where you kind of started lying, to like small white lies to your parents? I would argue that sometimes it's better to lie to Asian parents than to tell them the truth. Can you give us an example that will not get you in trouble? Uh, for example, if I am going out late at night and it's it's not even something unsafe, it's literally like I'm going to go and get dinner or something. But if it's past 9 p.m., I know my parents would probably freak out. This is for my college days, not for right now. I would just tell them I'm going to bed. Good night. And then not leave any traces on social media or anything like that. I think my parents do the same thing with their parents. But like, they won't admit that. But I think similarly... I think I was a pretty good kid in college. I didn't really do any drugs or alcohol or anything like Me that. Either. So I tried to shield. I think the lies I had was I tried to shield my parents away from those things. So they're like harmless lies. There are a lot of things that parents, like Asian parents, don't understand happens on college campuses too, right? Yes. Like the, you know, what happens at night, the parties. You need to learn what to pre-filter out and not tell your parents for their own good. It's like a learning curve because at first you're so excited and you want to share what's going on with your parents. And then you slowly learn like, oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't share this information. It'll just end up in a lecture. Like if they ask you, what did you do last night? Study. <laughs> That's not withholding information. <laughs> That's lying. I mean, I probably did study, but I just also did other stuff. Oh, okay. Wait, it's like so, um, it's like ingrained. Like it just comes Study, to- studying. <laughs> like even now, like basically I- when I come into the room, Mickey's like on her laptop, like on the couch and it's yeah. like anime. And then she just like control M or something. It just like minimizes the screen immediately. <laughs> because I used to get scolded for watching TV when I wasn't supposed to. So even to this day, like I still have that. Like I feel like I'm still not allowed to watch like YouTube. Do you even feel that way? you're on YouTube, like you're the one making the videos. I know, but I feel like I'm not allowed to watch it. Like it's not productive. Okay, maybe we should have a see, like an intervention for that. Yeah, therapy. Right. What if you don't want to go to college and your parents are forcing you to get a degree how can you approach that conversation well one what is your reason for not wanting to go to college is there some bigger plan or better thing that you're off to do or maybe you need mental clarity and you need a couple years i think all of those reasons are okay but truly identifying that clearly with yourself and being very honest like am i just not wanting to go because i want to defy my parents or am i not wanting to go for a better, bigger purpose. And then two, the biggest thing, again, financial ties. If you are going to make decisions against their recommendation, then you need to be ready to financially take care of everything on your own. I know it sounds harsh, but again, you cannot expect them to support you if you are not following their recommendations. Again, the reason is why aren't you attending college? If you don't like school, you still need to figure out a way to support yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, maybe I can go to like electrician school or some sort of thing that you can, you know, generate your own income. I want to talk about the empty nesting period because I would say it was the most turbulent time of my relationship with my parents. And it's typically not something that goes away quickly. It's usually many, many, many years. I would say between three to six years or so. And there will be periods where everything feels great again. And then you'll go back into feeling like horribly, you're going to fight again. Like it comes in big, big waves. 
there will probably be periods where you don't speak to your parents at all or speak to them very minimally. And it will hurt you. It'll hurt your heart. It'll hurt their heart. But sometimes you kind of need a little space to both grow up. I would like to personally say that my parents have done so much growth. And, you know, similarly, I have too, but it's not impossible for them to grow and learn and adjust. And, you know, they will slowly find their footing again in the hobbies that they enjoy and the things that they had in their life before you came in. Because, you know, for 18 years, they give up their entire lives to support you, to love you, to care for you. And I know, again, the American mindset is like, well, I didn't ask you to do that, but they did. And they wanted to do that for you. So you have to give them time and the patience to adjust. All right, the last, I think the last question about transitioning to adulthood from one of our viewers. How do I find my identity other than the role of a daughter? I feel that my parents see me as only a daughter when in fact I am a whole adult. I think it's okay that there is no answer to this question. You're always gonna be a daughter or a son. I think the answer is how do you define yourself? If you can't even define clearly to yourself what you want to be, maybe that's why they also have a hard time figuring out what to identify you as. I think a lot of the times we seek validation from our parents, but it's actually ourselves. We are the ones not giving ourselves love and praise and we're expecting it to come from external places and you can't expect that until it comes first from within. Let's move on to our next section. It's a taboo section in the Asian culture. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit about mental health. The first thing is the belief of mental health in Asian culture. How do you feel about the stigma behind, you know, depression and all these things regarding mental health? I think a lot of people don't believe that it exists. Like they think that mental health problems are just personal issues or you need to just put your head down and work harder and these issues will disappear. And it's 99.9% of that is not that. I think what's most difficult is when you are being so vulnerable and bringing up these conversations to the people that you care about most. And when they dismiss that, it can be really hard. Yeah. I think one of the biggest memes that exist out there is, you know, when Asian parents are like, oh, you're doing this now. We did it so much harder back when we were a kid. And I think that mentality is a little bit unhealthy. Like the meme is like, oh, you walk one mile now to school. I walk 10 miles now with 50 pound bag of rice in In the the snow. snow. It's hard to kind of levy or change your expectations because of what they think they went through. I mean, maybe they didn't walk 10 miles. It might have been five miles or five kilometers or whatever unit they Mm -hmm. used. I think there's a human expectations where people want you to struggle in the same way that they did when they were growing up. I think it's similar even in residency, how the medical system is working. Like the older attendings and all the older people who have come kind of gone through the same steps Mm -hmm. that you have want you to go through the same steps as they did, even though they already know it's kind of messed up. And I think if you can't get support from your parents and it's not something that you foresee changing, I think it's important to start that conversation. But in the meantime, you need to get support from other people, whether it's your friends, your relationship, you know, counselors at school, a lot of schools have free resources for you. Finding somebody who will support you in the meantime, like don't wait. If you know something is wrong, like you need to get help and it's okay and it's completely normal. I openly shared this with you guys last year, but I had done therapy. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever tried therapy. Honestly, even I was skeptical, like, does this really work? Because I tried it once before and it was, you know, I think there were some lessons that I learned from it, but it was difficult because the therapist did not understand like Asian family dynamics. Like I remember trying to like explain how I couldn't set boundaries. And she was like, why don't you just close your bedroom door? And this time I found somebody who, uh, is also Asian American. And so she understood a lot of the struggles that I went through and sometimes it's helpful just to talk to somebody who can put things into a different perspective for you and to have somebody who's not in your life right because everybody has biases so to have somebody who's like completely out of your life kind of help you look from a bird's eye view I think is very helpful and I highly recommend it if you need it and then there are ways in which I think you can help bring your parents into the picture so I'll tell like a personal story I think 
the beginning of my research or our R2 year was really difficult. I think my parents really didn't understand it, like why I was struggling, right? So like, when you explained that you were struggling, what did they say back to you? They're like, oh, I mean, a lot of people went through this. Like a lot of people went through residency. They're doing fine. Like you just need to get through the last next couple of years. Or they're like, oh yeah, I have friends and family who did went through it. I mean, it's not easy, but- You just have to do it. Do it. Key point here is that they didn't really understand exactly what I was doing. And it's kind of partially my fault that I wasn't the best at explaining what I had to go through right. on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess my point was that I wanted my parents to understand yeah. what I was going through. And I think it just takes a bit of time to invest to tell them you know how messed up things were so you can't expect your parents to understand everything you can't expect them to understand if you didn't even take the time to explain it to yeah. them in the first so, place either do you want to talk a little bit about helicopter mom tiger mom i think helicopter parents tiger parents which unfortunately I, there is certainly a higher incidence in the asian community it it's really hard because i think that kind of parenting style makes children base their self-worth on external achievements and they often spend their lives chasing goals that are never enough. Or goals that are not for yourself, but goals that other people want you to accomplish. Yeah, and, and it's never enough and it's, it's a mental game more than anything. Praising my kid for placing first place versus praising them for the effort that they put in to get into first place are two very different things. I think when I was a kid, I always was like, oh, I wanna get first place because I want to make my parents happy. I want to make my parents proud, right? But being able to transition that from when you're younger to when you're older, being like, oh, I want to get first place or I want to do this for myself, I think is a big point in your life where if I think it's healthy for you to recognize that switch. Okay, my favorite part, juicy part. Oh We're talking about relationships, is specifically with regards, let's not talk about the good stuff, let's just talk about the bad stuff. What do you do when your Asian parents do not approve of the person you are dating? No, I think, you know, when we talk about these things, your parents are probably better than you about the red flags and green flags thing because they look at things more objectively than you do. Yes, I think they have a very practical perspective of love. Like, will this person make enough money? Will this person be able to support you? Are they tall enough? Are they... Pretty, Will your babies uh, be genetically superior? Yeah. Right. And they often don't think about your feelings. The thing that sometimes they might not understand is like not every person you date is for end game, right? Like, yes, obviously I would love it if the first first person I dated ended up being the person I married. But like sometimes you need to build up experience and learn how to love and how to be in a relationship and that takes time and that takes practice i think my parents would say i don't want you to have to take the extra road and i don't want you to get hurt is often the explanation that they would say if they're like don't like the person that you're dating keep your eyes open but i think it's a actually an important like litmus test for you know bringing your significant other to see your parents because it's yeah. it can make or break a relationship and i think it's not necessarily a bad thing if you really like this person mm -hmm. you should be able to convince your parents that they're good for you dude right? i hate to admit it but they're usually right in the end they're they're usually right like the things that they po point out to be red flags usually are red flags and again i think the reason we get so defensive about it is because it's partially we, true yes we secretly know but like obviously it hurts to yeah. hear it i think the way that they package it oftentimes can be more hurtful than it needs to yes. be yes um, <laughs> can you give an example well i've dated people that are don't speak chinese okay the communication turned into something that i care about a lot more than i used to yeah and they were like yeah i can't really like, like literally talk to this person it doesn't work <laughs> and i kind of like more agreeable about that now yeah i mean hindsight <laughs> again is 2020 right now um, i think the other thing is how do you prepare your partner to meet your parents like you need to go through like we're literally both asian but every parent's different you need to tell your partner what are the things that are going to irk your parents what are the things you should absolutely say what gifts should you bring how do you prepare game your partner yeah. yeah how do you prepare your partner for success do you have some tips i don't know i think you're much better than me at 
doing that. I would say number one, always bring a gift. Even if they're not people who like gifts, always never ever go empty handed. Fruits is a classic option, but you know, let's say if they're really into like tea or if they're into chocolate, like whatever it might be, like find something and make sure it's something that's thoughtful, not something you just grabbed from your pantry, okay? And package it nicely. Like don't just throw it in a plastic bag. I guess we're Asian parents don't usually do that for other people, but they like to receive nice things. Number two, if your partner does not speak the language that your parents speak, prepare at least a couple phrases for them to speak. Make it cute. Yes, make it cute because you could totally spin it in a cute way. And number three, tell them not to argue or disagree about anything, at least initially. I think Asian parents like the guai guai, the where you just you kind of go along with what they are saying. And then number four, make sure you tell the things that are off limits, like things you should not discuss. Like maybe you guys went on a camping trip to Yosemite, but your parents really don't want you to do that. Like make sure your partner knows what they should not be talking about. You should show that you really care about their son or daughter, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's important, but that's should be a given. A given. I think the first impression matters the most. Like yes. the, the first, first impressions. Yeah. Oh, and uh, along those same lines, really think about the things that you want to tell your parents about your partner. Like, I know sometimes we want to vent, we want to say bad things when, you know, maybe they did something that was so stupid and you just want to share because it's funny. But really think about if your parents is the right audience to tell that information yeah. to, because a lot of the times, like you can't take it back once it's been said and they will use it as an example for a hundred different things down the line. What should you wear when you meet them and where should you meet? Um, I would say success? Th the best scenario to meet is over uh, like a meal, preferably lunch. That's a bit more casual and outside, not in anyone's home, preferably like a restaurant and you would want to neutral ground yes neutral ground and dress on the more conservative side okay but okay truly what happens if your parents hate the person you're dating and you still want to date them i think that's fine you just have to balance it's going to be tough but you need to your partner needs to be okay with it you need to be okay with it your parents need to be okay with it and you have to figure out why they don't like them why you're okay with why they don't like them. There just needs to be a lot of why and figure out a lot of soul searching, <laughs> right? But it's not it's not an easy situation. I mean, you're never going to find someone who's like perfect and they love every single thing about them. Parents can come around. They can come around sometimes. Also, relationships can also not exist anymore too. Like it's Yes. Like it it's goes not both like ways. A fixed I think we're going to make this into a part two because we still have a lot of points and we still haven't gotten to them. So in the next episode, we'll be talking about financial obligations with Asian parents and how to handle finances and those conversations. And we'll also be discussing the idea of how to break through some of these boundaries, these precedents, and how to be the best Asian kid you can be while still loving and supporting your parents, basically. And the next part would be Looking at our future, we're going to be Asian parents someday too. What are the things that we can learn from our parents and what are the things that... We definitely won't be doing with our kids. That's the more interesting. That's the more fun part, I think. And so that's it for today. Bye, Sassy Fam.